and yeah, we can begin. Okay, uh, so good afternoon, good evening to you all, uh, uh, to everyone present on this occasion of the launch of Aging Experiments, uh, Futures <laughs> and Fantasy of Old Age. Uh, I, I would like to, to greet and congratulate uh, the authors and the editor, uh, uh, Mariana Cast uh, Castelli Rosa, Carmen Concilio, uh, João Paulo Guimarães, um, Gion Home, Michael Davidson, I knew Lee, and I'm sorry for pronouncing badly your, your names, uh, Ryan Bell, uh, Patricia Silva, uh, Jade Elizabeth French, Sofia Matos Silva, Maricel Orapiqueras, uh, and Sarah Falcos. Thank you all. Um, uh, in fact, and it's pointed out uh, by Jean Paulo uh, in, the, in the book. Uh, this work offers readers relevant critical contributions uh, on alternative representations of aging, uh, alternative discourses, perspectives on aging that challenge predominant narratives of decline as well as fantasies of eternal youth. And for these reasons, uh, uh, this work is certainly a, a valuable one in the field of aging studies. So, as a, as a as scientific coordinator of the Institute for Comparative Literature, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here with you, uh, sharing this moment, the, talking about with you about the book, and thanking uh, once again and congratulating once again the authors and the editors, because this work addresses uh, issues uh, that are relevant and current issues nowadays and um, the issues that um, are addressed also in the project of our research unit. So uh, thank you all and uh, a special thanks for uh, João Paulo and for inviting me to be here with you, with you today. Thank you very much. No, thank you, Professor Fatima. I know you're very busy, so I'm, no. I'm very glad you were able to make it. <laughs> so let's see, let's see here. Let's, uh, let me try to, okay, there we go. So, so welcome everyone. And, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I hope you like the, the, um, the background for, for my, for my window, I mean, I I I know that a lot of people commented uh, when when the book came out that they you know it was very uh, timely that the book uh, came out at the same time as Barbie or more or less. Uh, the same time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm unfortunately I don't have like a pink uh, shirt myself, but I'm uh, I'm wearing can colors, right? So you can get both. You can get the pink and the and the blue uh, in the background. So you know, it's very it's very nice. Uh, as I was uh, telling Michael um, before you guys arrived, it's very nice that we can get uh, you know most of the people that were present uh, at the original uh, aging experiments conference in uh, 2020 uh, here because the recording is no longer available because I don't know I don't know why, but the sound didn't get recorded. Uh, so hopefully that doesn't happen this time. <laughs> the sound didn't get recorded, uh, so we had to delete the the entire thing, which which is unfortunate because like a couple of people did not end up um, participating in in the book. So you, you know their their papers, uh, I'm, I'm sure will be published somewhere else <laughs> eventually. The 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 recording for another conference that I organized, I'm sorry, um, at, at the at the Comparative Literature Institute uh, called Fear of Aging, and that the the, the collection the, the 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 edited collection that that is going to come out of that is still being uh, um, you know produced, but that that did get recorded and that is in the uh, YouTube channel of the Comparative Literature Institute, <laughs> which has a lot of you know, great content. I don't know if you're aware, right? We, we, we keep putting out good stuff. And uh, for example, Michael, I, I don't know if you notice that we have this, this series uh, called Poets Talk Politics and you know, knowing that poetry is your, your thing, we you know, every month you know, put out uh, interesting interviews with uh, you know contemporary experimental poets, so that's always nice. You know, um, 
nice, uh, you know, nice uh, to know that um, the Institute, right, the Comparative Literature Institute, keep, you know, tries to do a nice curation of, of all the events that uh, we do as a unit, as a research uh, unit. I, then, uh, you know, let me just uh, say something very brief. I mean, oh, this, this is all going to be very brief. I'm not going to keep you here for, for very long, I promise. Uh, you know, about a book, about the book itself, right? What I um, think was sort of unique and, you know, special about this event and then, you know, this, this book that we now, we now have is that it, it, it sort of congregates genres that you don't, you don't normally see uh, being thrown together, right? So you don't normally see experiment experimental writing alongside fantasy and sci-fi, right? So those things sort of, you know, are seen as being unrelated. They have nothing to do with each other. And, and I did have, uh, as, as some of you know, right? I, when I was pitching the collection to a publisher, I did run into that problem, right? Like, so people were saying, you know, uh, you know we, we really don't see like how this all like connects. Uh, but I do believe that that's the book's sort of strength as well, right? The fact that um, all of these contributions, in a way, uh, as I try to explain in my in, in my introduction, right, focus on this idea of like uh, unnatural aging, right, or defamiliarizing the pro the the process of aging, or uh, you know, making aging weird, right? So all of them. I think all of these contributions in a way deal with aging from an angle that we don't necessarily encounter all the time, right? The, the, the main, I think, I think mainstream research or, or most research in aging studies is still, uh, you know, done um, about, uh, you know, realist or autobiographical fiction uh, or film, right? So it, it's, and, and it's not, not, normally very as i think most of these essays are not very playful or humorous or or it, what i tried to do here and you know at, and what we i think accomplished as a group right is to also you know um make clear that aging is not always or doesn't have to be about like you know you know, sadness or pain or, or, or you know, uh, uh, health issues and whatnot. But it has, it has, there's a, a plethora of things that aging involves, right? That I think we managed to capture in, in the book, right? With these three uh, different uh, genres that we, we sort of uh, brought to the table here, right? Then um, uh, Maricel and Sarah have, as, as some of you may know, in, in, uh, the process, right? So we we did this in 2020. They did then uh, did put together a collection that is fully um, that fully focuses on speculative fiction, right? That that has already come out, and and maybe later we can uh, or they can you know tell you a little bit about that, right? Um, what I but I I I do think that uh, uh, one thing that this book even in you know in what those genres are concerned does manage to to know when mariana was not here yet so uh, let me let her in um one thing we we do here is because some of these essays are also about fantasy right so fantasy is very it's a very particular genre right and and so i think the people that ultimately you know did work on the genre Right, so Jiwan did something on the Lord of the Rings, and um, Ishiguro, I did something on on um, this. Welcome, Mariana. Uh, Mar so Mariana did something on Mary Poppins, for example. So, so all of these, I think, all of these essays are also important to, um, or or the genre of fantasy is important to talk about, like especially alongside, you know, speculative fiction and science fiction, because. The idea we have, right, as, as I think Jiwon puts it, and I and I try to do the same more or less in my very brief uh, contribution, right? 
fantasy is normally seen as a very conservative genre, right? It's it's seen as like backward looking. Uh, uh, it's all about you know how great the Middle Ages were, you know, and uh, you know, and as, as you I think put it, G one, right? It, it's normally used to sort of celebrate nationalist values and whatnot. So I I, I think it it it's nice that we get those genres, you know, side by side so that we see that that's not necessarily the case, right? Fantasy also, I think, does some interesting work in, again, like defamiliarizing, you know, uh, making aging weird and unnatural and right and and then going against the the preconceived ideas of that we have in, um, about what aging is or is supposed to be about right so uh so that you know about the the how the book ev eventually came together so I, I just wanted to say something uh very briefly about that right so as you know we had the conference and then now we have a couple of people here at, at this event that weren't in the original uh um conference right so that was that was nice because number one right i I thought that when we did the conference, I did I did not so I, I don't I don't I don't know if you know this, but I did not get a lot of submissions, right? So the the people that we uh had at the conference, I believe we had around, I don't know, 10 people more or less, or 10 speakers, maybe, um eight. Um, so I but the event did not uh, receive a lot of submissions, right? But which was sad, right? Because I thought, you know, here's a you know an interesting topic that um, it's maybe a little a little far out, and pe people don't want to think about, the, you know, how these things connect to 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 each other. But uh, um, one so first thing that I did that I thought was significant was to invite uh, Professor. Uh, Michael Davidson to be the the keynote uh, speaker uh, for the event uh, because he is not an aging studies expert, right? Yeah, but I'm aging. Well, <laughs> no, but you know, you know what I mean, Michael, right? Like I, I I thought it was nice that you are you know an experimental poetry scholar, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. and you do work no, in disability <laughs> studies. So I thought, you know, why don't I, you know, see if Michael Davidson would be willing to, you know, say something about this topic, right? Instead of actually, you know, trying to invite, a, you know, an expert in, in the field, right? Which, and, and that's, okay, and that's that's what I think another strength that this book has is, is that a number of people that ended up contributing are not in the aging studies sphere, Right, are not aging studies experts, right? So, for example, and you know, uh, which is why I'm very happy that I got uh, Ryan and G1 to uh, you know contribute to the volume, and uh, also my student uh, Sophia, um, and I'll and I'll say something about that as well, right? The fact that we have also you know people uh, you know contributions I think from different stages in the academic career, right? So Sophia is an MA student. Uh, so that also matters because the the text that she produced is, of course, very non-specialized, right? In the sense that you know it, it's not a an essay that you know uh, maybe a you know tenured academic would produce, and that's nice, right? I, I think that that's cool. It's cool that we get people from all walks of life, all walks of academic life, I guess, in in the collection, right? So, and, you know, again, as I was saying, Ryan and Jiwon are not, uh, uh, you know, aging studies experts. So it was nice, right? Like, it, it was nice that they accepted because I I, uh, I was like, well, you know, I would really like to have more fantasy essays in the collection because we don't really have like any, even though that's what the conference was promising, right? It was promising to be like a conference about like, the avant-garde fantasy and and sci-fi and yet the only i believe the only fantasy paper that i had was by vanessa uh, yosen who ended up not being able to i think i think she she uh she did publish in your collection Maricel and sarah right because i think the issue there was was with um it, it having to be open access right like her work 
had to be open access. She she couldn't publish in this one, right? Because this was not supposed to be open access uh, originally. Um, but in any case, I didn't have any fantasy assets, so I was very happy to uh, that that you know G1 and Mariana uh, later um, decided to you know write write uh, on Mary Poppins and the Lord of the Rings, uh, and I you know I I I myself like. Um, also try to fill in that gap, right? Because of course, as, as I think some of you know, I'm not a fantasy scholar either, right? So I, I do mostly, I, I mostly work on, on experimental poetry, right? But I like, well, but I, but I think that, um, you know, the collection should be, should have more of that, yeah. right? So, yeah. Um, so that's that's something I wanted to emphasize, right? So both both the fact that some of the people here are non-specialists, and I think that's a good thing, right? Because I don't know I don't know if you had the opportunity to read the G1 and and Ryan's at essay essays, but they 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 don't cite uh, you know the people that you would expect uh, a person to cite in a collection like this, right? So they, they don't, I mean, you know, uh, uh, when I when I write an, you know, let's say a, an aging studies paper, I will cite Maricel and Sarah, right? So for example, right? So very established um, scholars in the field, right? And and it's nice that they don't do, it's nice, right? In, in the sense that you get an, an, an element of unpredictability and and also, you know, it's, it's, it's refreshing, right? To, to encounter, uh, you know, perspectives that haven't been necessarily, you know, already um, conditioned by, you know, the the sort of work that's being done in the field, right? Very good work, of course, right? But you know, you know what I mean. Um, and um, yeah, no, no, just just wanted to also say before I so before I shut up, right? Which I will. It, at some point, uh, that when we did this, uh, there wasn't a lot of work uh, done on these these genres, right? So that there was only, I, I believe, like that. You know, of course, Elizabeth Barry had done uh, work on on Samuel Beckett, and so you know, an experimental avant-garde uh, writer and aging uh, Scott Herring. Uh, had done a very nice paper on Juna Barnes, uh, but as as and, and of course there's the uh, uh, you know th this is for the aging studies people right of course there's the 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 I think 1970 something uh, book that Kathleen Woodward put out about um, you know um, Pound Elliot and 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 Wallace Stevens that you know you you could say is about the same sort of aesthetics, but you know, uh, I I don't think in that book she particularly emphasizes like the radical experimental nature of their writing. Anyway, I, I that's my at least the recollection I have of that book. So anyway, this was not a topic that had been explored a lot, right? Like ex experimental art and aging. Um, and, and the same goes for the other genres, right? Um, um, there was like Emilia DeFalco and, and Ula uh, Kriberneg had done some work on, on you know, um, speculative fiction, but that, you know, so it was sort of new. Now, I don't know, I don't know if it is anymore since there's this, there's this book and uh, Sarah and Maricel, um, we've, we've, I think done, We've we've covered a lot of ground, right, in these two collections. So, which is nice, right? Uh, so, just and just a, a one last thing, right? Another thing I'm very happy about, right, is that even in terms of the avant-garde, right, and experimental, uh, you know, art, right, we we do manage to cover a lot of genres, right? So, uh, there's there's Professor Michael Davidson's. Um, text, which is itself very diverse, right? So uh, Michael, you focus on Merce Cunningham and, you know, and John Cage and, and Williams and, and um, mm -hmm. uh, William James and whatnot, right? So your, your, your text is itself very diverse and eclectic, but then, you know, we have Ryan's uh, contribution, which is about music. 
Heyoon's uh, um, paper is about, you know, experimental dance. Uh, so I'm, I'm happy that 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 we managed to pull it off, right? Um, uh, Heyoon's paper, by the way, uh, the original paper was supposed to be, I believe, right? Before Heyoon got on board, um, it was one of her colleagues, I believe, at the University of Alberta that was going to submit uh, an essay on theater, right? Which ends up not being super well represented in the collection, but, you know, we have, we have dance, right? Which is nice. So, so it's a very eclectic, I think, uh, collection at the end of the day. Um, so that's that's what I have to say for now. I'll, I'll let, let you guys, um, you know, jump in and say um, what you, thought went well about the, what you like about the book. Um, and then I have a few more questions later on, like what you like, what you think. Uh, and let me let me say this, uh, the um, just one one final thing. Like, I, I apologize. I, I don't know. I, I know that some of you have noticed this, that there are a few typos here and there in the collection. Which uh, are are of course like my fault, but also the I, I think the the editorial uh, process right like I I didn't catch them when I read uh, the manuscript the first time. Then the editor, the oh, I'm sorry, the project manager didn't catch them either. So yeah, there there's there's a couple of typos here and there. So I I apologize for that. But uh, hopefully the ideas are are still. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, um, yeah, you, you can still understand what's being said, you know, and the ideas that is being expressed. So hopefully that, that's all there. Uh, so yeah, just wanted want to open it up a, a little bit for uh, you guys to, to jump in and say uh, whatever you want. And then I'll, I'll, I'll just ask uh, another set of general questions. Well, I'll, I'll start. Um, I just want to thank Joao for shepherding this project through from the conference to the book. <clears throat> You've been um, an exemplary uh, editor and, uh, and uh, enthusiast for this project. And one of the things I really enjoyed about writing my piece for this was the chance to explore the terms that you've set forth, uh, as you said, in this rather um, idiosyncratic idea of links between aging and experiment. So once I got the once I got the nod, I had to start thinking outside the box, which I think is what you are trying to provoke. Um, what are the relationships between aging and experimentalism? And of course, it it became obvious after thinking about this for a while that becoming um, older, but I'm saying becoming older throughout the life course and not just simply as, a, as one of the authors said, a, a series of stages, um, is the need to constantly retrofit your imagination of what the future is and what the body is. You're always doing this as a matter of, um, uh, the body going through its various changes. And that is an innovative practice. Uh, you learn to work more with different aspects of your body. Uh, if in my case, uh, losing my hearing meant that I had to renegotiate uh, practically everything I took for granted about social experience, um, about conversation, about what the meaning of voice was and the importance, the political importance of voice in a culture that privileges hearing. And I had to start thinking about this, uh, this question of aging as an experimental moment from the very moment that we actually uh, imagine that we, we have a body that's not working the way that society says it should work. Uh, so I, th I thought all of the essays in this book were a revelation to me. I really enjoyed uh, learning about uh, different uh, genres, different authors, particularly speculative fiction, as you said. But I thought Ryan's piece on Keith Rowe was particularly uh, useful for me for thinking about uh, other possibilities of music beyond the acoustic. 
I, I love uh, Laura, uh, uh, Leonora Carrington's uh, hearing trumpet, but Jade's uh, Leonora, uh, uh, Jade, Jade's uh, article on Carrington was just terrific for thinking about the prosthetic as a component of the body. And I also um, was happy to see a number of authors bringing Jack Halberstam's notions about queer temporality and various theories of temporality that are very appropriate for disability studies, um, alternate ways of, of thinking about time that were so um, important in Maricel's and Sarah's essays on speculative fiction. And I uh, got to meet a whole series of disabled artists that I would not have been able to meet. And the one I'm thinking about in particular is Hun Jung Lee's essay on the Finnish dancer Tuli Helke Hella, uh, who literally begins to create uh, through her experience of cerebral palsy and dance at a very late stage. So all of these um, interventions into the terms of your title were helpful for me as somebody who works primarily in disability studies to rethink the adage in disability studies that, well, we all become disabled as we get older. Uh, but it seems to me that that adage doesn't take into consideration the various stages that one goes through in the aging process, and furthermore, doesn't investigate the aesthetic decisions that have to be made when a person uh, uh, loses their sight or develops dementia or who um, uh, has to be, begins to live in a wheelchair and so forth. Anyway, so I applaud uh, everyone in this book. I really enjoyed reading all of the essays, and Joao uh, in particular, I want to applaud you for carrying this through with such an uh, such integrity. Thanks a lot, uh, Michael, for for the you, you know your kind kind words. The, the it's 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 yeah. It's a shame Jade Jada uh, wasn't uh, able to make it today. Uh, um, she she got COVID, by the way, which is yeah. apparently coming back. My wife got it. Uh, going uh, yeah, it's yeah. It, it yeah, it's a thing again. So um, no, but, but uh, I wanted to take uh, what what you said about uh, 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 Ryan's. I'm, I'm gonna sorry guys. I'm gonna start picking on you individually now. <laughs> the, but you know, Ryan, I I I was also very very interested in in the way you talked about the notion of retirement, right, in the music industry, right, and the 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 way you sort of contrasted, you know, how Keith Rowe approached the you know the 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 his disability right he became aware that he uh got parkinson halfway right as you put it right like halfway through a performance right so it's and it's recorded right which uh, as you point out it's very counterintuitive since improvisation and the the you know the sort of improvisation that he uh is involved in um isn't meant to be uh, recorded right but here you gotta but, but one thing i wanted you to maybe expand upon is that that very and, and you do it i mean i know you're a very funny funny guy right like because of course we're, we're you know we're friends and i know and i know you're really funny and and in the essay you make this really interesting contrast between the you know the retirement tours that a lot of pop bands do right and the way that this guy embraced his aging and embraced his disability, right? And yet uh, kept, not, not and yet, right? So this is something that I believe Michael uh, uh, really emphasized in his own paper, right? This, uh, you know, how disability can, you know, uh, fuel the creative process, right? Can make the creative process more, uh, you know, adventurous and whatnot, right? So, you know, I just wanted you to maybe, you know, talk a little bit about the, that distinction, right? And how some people embrace, uh, you know, aging, how, you know, in the music industry and and, and how Keith Rowe does it in his. Uh... Yeah, so um, the album in question, right, is Absence, which came out a few years ago on Erstwhile, was recorded in 2017. Um, and like Zhao just mentioned, right, there is a moment of about 10 seconds um, that Roe himself points out in the liner notes saying, 
this is the moment, the brief window of time where I made the decision to retire. Um, and so thinking about retirement, yeah, I, I did start by often comparing it to, you know, pop stars retirement tours, which are these grand spectacles of retirement, right? Saying this is my final tour, um, which of course is then almost always met with a repetition of the reunion tour, which is the new retirement tour. And obviously Rose not doing anything like that, but I do think that this prompted me, you know, your book in general prompted me to think about these musical communities that I'm so invested in and that Roe himself is kind of at the center at uh, of um, like joining on the one hand free jazz and free improvisation in the 60s and beyond and then indeterminacy and like post KG and experimental music, both of them being very interested in uh, the ephemeral, the unrepeatable and the only once. Um, but I don't know. I mean, the more I think about this, uh, I'm really interested in how the album and performance itself was recorded and that how recording itself becomes a date or a dating, something that's seemingly permanent, but revisited endlessly and infinitely um, beyond the end of performance. Um, and so with Roe, you making that decision in the middle of his performance, um, I don't know. I mean, we, we talk about fantasies of old age and fantasies of eternal life. Um, like there's the fantasies that performers and listeners themselves imagine, but the, there's also the sense that canon, memory, and legacy are themselves fantasies of old age, right? Or of age beyond um, passing, even distortions of what actually happened through a prism that serves the present. Um, and so I think that these musical communities that are always invested in the only once, the ephemeral, like aging and retirement and all of these questions that are central to the book, we don't think about them as being very important to experimental music, but I think that impulse is always there um, and always has been. There's been you know, a tendency to look at it through Zen via Cage or maybe through economies of music and the commodity form that the recording represents, but really um, you know, they're kind of staging a very complex uh, <laughs> intervention and like what it means to age or, or, or to not age, right? Because the ideal is just to have one performance that ends and that then it's over. But of course, the recording complicates this. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, 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 yeah, uh, the, that definitely that, that whole notion, which is, again, I guess, particular to your essay, right? The ephemeral, right? That's, a, that's a very, I think all of the essays, of course, you know, deal with in, inevitably deal with different you know understanding understandings of time, right? But uh, yours definitely foregrounds this this very specific mode of, of experiencing time, which is the you know the ephemeral and the, the irreparable. Um, yeah, and uh, let me let me just ask again: like, does does anyone want to uh, jump in and talk, say something general about the collection? I, because otherwise, I'm just gonna keep <laughs> keep going and picking on on individual people. To um... yeah, I'm, I'm happy to go on <laughs> if it's okay. Of well, course. just I I completely agree with Michael. Thank you very much, Joe, for putting this. I mean, for the conference, which was very enlightening, and also for putting all these essays together in in a collection. Uh, actually, um, Saran, I I was in Huddersfield for a short uh, research stay. And, and one of the topics that uh, Sarah and me talked about was precisely the fact of how speculative fiction and, and genres that um, are not realist or realist based make you think about aging. And, and actually we, our volume was the result of a, of a couple of panels that we organized in the essay conference in, in 2019. And shortly afterwards came your, your seminar, your conference also. So we, as you said before, we were kind of thinking about similar things, you know, quite at the same time, but then with the pandemics and everything, the volumes, you know, the, at least our volume was a bit delayed in, in, in its publishing, but, uh, but I completely agree with, with basically everything you said in, you know, in your initial presentation, that the fact that uh, these genres, uh, fantasy, science fiction and speculative, different 
um, formats of speculative fiction make you think about aging from a completely different perspective, no? Make you uh, get out of the box, and and that was our intention. And I guess, uh, and also, it's it's very much present in the volume, and it's I, I just find it wonderful that there is. Um, that we have uh, Mariana's paper on Mary Poppins because actually Mary Poppins tells <laughs> says a lot about uh, aging, non-aging, different perspectives of time, what it, what it means to be a child and to be an adult and a child at the same time. So, so yeah, I, I, I mean, uh, all the essays, uh, this is what I find great about uh, this volume and about the speculative fiction in general, no? the fact that it, it makes you think about uh, aging from a different perspective and, and, you know, and we don't relate aging to, I don't know, gray hair, as you said, no, gray hair or, uh, or illness or whatever anymore but but actually all the ages live together no and it, it they have a lot to do with our conception of time which is what we were trying to prove in our in our paper no through the through the different texts that we analyzed there so well again uh, thank you for this and I think I mean this this is part of the conversations we had with Sara uh, from uh, 2017 up until now no the fact that we we really need to think uh, or to to include these genres into thinking about all the topics related to aging to aging studies so I think it was uh, very necessary to do that yeah, yeah, for sure, uh, and 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 it's nice. It's nice. Uh, I, I was as I was, of course, joking that you know our our you know uh, um, our collections are like you know uh, rivals or you know you know competitors <laughs> or whatever, right? But I, but I do think they they complement each other, and they're trying to. I, I think also at the end of the day, they're trying to do different things. Uh, so yeah. do, do you guys, do you and Sarah maybe want to say something about your own uh, uh, book and how it maybe ties into this or it differs, differs from what we did here? Um, I think that they are quite complementary, I could <laughs> say. Our, our intention was to focus more on a specifically a speculative fiction uh, so texts that think about the future, no, or, or that imagine possible futures, let's say. So maybe this is more related to our volume than to aging experiments, in which you get a, a you know, you get different perspectives. But uh, but I would say that they are quite complementary. Yeah. Yeah. I just uh, yeah. I just um, second that. I think that we we had a sort. Of slightly narrower focus on the speculative um and science fiction whereas your collection you know, is it's much broader and and um you know really really interesting and complementary for that reason and it's it's really it's really enjoyable to have them side by side and and see those those different voices um in interaction so um i think you can only help to grow the the field field of study um which is, is is great for all of us i think and thank you for all of your work again um um oh you're back sarah you're, you, we we weren't able to to hear you very well, but I but I think we got the gist of what you were saying. So I, I think we got it. Thank you very much. <laughs> no, no, but you know, since uh, let me pick on on G one now. Sorry, G one. Uh, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. But uh, but since <laughs> since um, you know this uh, collection and but both, I mean, you know, again, like Sarah and Maricel's book. And this collection are so much um, focused on the future, right? Or have uh, you know place an emphasis on the future? Uh, I wanted maybe you and I because I think I think 
in the collection, it's mostly the two of us that that talk about the past, right, and the Middle Ages, right, and and what fantasy, uh, you know, sort of brings to the table uh, in in terms of this uh, this discussion. Do you want to say, uh, you know, something about how elves and uh, you know the idea of immortality that we find in Tolkien, uh, you know, and and the Witcher, right? Because your 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 initially your um, your your plan was to write about the Lord of the Rings, the you know the Silmarillion, the Hobbit, and and I you know and, and I annoyed I of course annoyed G one and I said hey G one mm -hmm. don't forget that you know there's now the Amazon uh, you know TV show that you gotta <laughs> you gotta talk about at least a little bit right because uh, you know yeah it is it is the latest incarnation of of you know this very as you as you yourself point out uh, uh, the most important book of the twentieth or most I, I don't know how you how you put it or how it's uh, phrased, but the, the most widely read book in the 20th century, right? The Lord of the Rings. Uh, so yeah, about the past, right? Like what is the past uh, or the past that we find in fantasy uh, has to contribute, I guess, to discussions about aging and, and, uh, and old age and, and the future of aging, right? What, what does the past say about the future, I guess? Is my is my question to you and to myself since I also wrote about that? Um, wow, that is like a very uh, broad question. I just had like thirty thoughts in my head, and then I lost all of them the moment he stopped talking. Um, I think that with fantasy, it's always it's always very difficult because the idea of fantasy is very restricted. These even now is very restricted to very medieval fantasy, which is why I specifically always say I'm writing about medievalist fantasy, because I think that it is a very specific brand of fantasy that came um, from the immense influence of Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. Um, and like you said during the introduction, I feel like there is a lot of um, understanding, sometimes the correct understanding and sometimes a little bit of misunderstanding regarding medievalist fantasy. Um, and people focus a lot, at least nowadays, on the nationalist aspect of it. And I think that a lot of good things get kind of like missed because of that. And I think that there still should be a focus on reading into um, what other things these works are talking about, because it is still one of the most um, popular form of uh, genre, right? Fantasy is so popular right now from like it went from lord of the rings to like the game of thrones which is still continuing and then there is the witcher now and there if you go on netflix there's just like hundreds of medievalist fantasy um so i just wanted to clarify about medievalist fantasy uh and i the new show was very hard for me because the focus was on the book the silmarillion um however it i did not think that it like really represented um, the book really well. But the thing that I did really like about um, the show kind of represented this and in the book is definitely very well represented in the Silmarillion specifically is the fact that, you know, like um, I think Ryan mentioned that like idea of this um, fantasy of eternity, right? Um, and elves are kind of fulfilling that fantasy of eternity. You're, you look beautiful forever, right? Um, and so there is that kind of desire even in real life about, you know, just being healthy and looking youthful. And that's just what people kind of strive for um, even now. And basically I thought that um, the Silmarillion was a very uh, important text in questioning that because Tolkien specifically is very much um, always emphasizing the jealousy that humans feel, uh, the jealousy that humans feel towards the elves and their eternal youth and eternal life. Um, but the irony is that elves really, really are actually the ones who are envious of the humans, of their aging and their ability to actually die. Um, so I just wanted to, you know, kind of show how it kind of like, I think you use the term um, de-familiarize, 
which I think is something that fantasy does a lot, right? Defamiliarize means also deconstructing the norm. And I think that fantasy is a great place to do that, to defamiliarize, and by doing that, just question what we believe to be normal and then kind of readjust our way of thinking. Um, so that's kind of the idea that I had. I don't know if I answered all of your questions. No, no, absolutely. I, I think that and, and, and that, and here's the thing, right? As you said, the, the bias that I think exists against uh, fantasy, right? Number one is that it's trash, right? And it's it's trash that kids uh, read mostly, right? Like kids and young adults or whatever, right? And what, so one thing that like I, I made sure to mention in the, in the introduction, right? Uh, is this, uh, to borrow this quote from uh, Michael Drought, who's uh, like a fantasy uh, and, and sci-fi sci expert. And one thing he says is that, you know, it, sure, you know, it may be, it may not be considered like uh, high literature, but the fact of the matter is that, you know, this is the kind of literature that most people read, right? And why is that, right? Like the, the, the reason is, the reason he, at least he gives, is that it addresses, right? Fantasy addresses a lot of the most uh, fundamental concerns that human beings have had like through the ages, right? Like he, he, he pitches, um, like he, um, I'm sorry, brings up Gilgamesh, right? As for example, the, the first, I guess fantasy text, right? That deals with the question of immortality, right? Right. So here you have like the first uh, literary text uh, that we know. Uh, I, I believe that's correct. That uh, the first literary text that we that was committed to uh, writing that focuses precisely on uh, a character that you know goes out of his way to. Uh, be you know try to become immortal right and and you you deal with that in your essay uh very nicely with the question of like immortality not be and i think that i guess like sarah and maricel also go um a lot into that right like what it means to be and is it not you know is it a good thing to be immortal or not right like is it desirable uh, <laughs> the like your answer, G one, right? Is that no? I mean, you, you know, the elves, uh, and especially in the in the Witcher, right? Like you, you, you give a lot of examples. I think in your essay of like instances in which elves are discriminated against for being immortal, right? And one thing, like I, I know you didn't like particularly like the show, but I would like to, I would like to defend the show and say that this new Amazon. Um, um, I'm sorry. This new, yeah, this new Amazon uh, um, adaptation, any in any case of the Silmarillion, uh, does focus a lot on that, right? Because the the, the one of the, the the central concerns, right, is like how are we gonna, you know, save the the, the elves or or you know let the elves continue being immortal, right? Because their immortality is at risk. That seems to be like maybe not a not a super valid reason for for people to care about their plight, right? They're like, yeah, I mean, as, as you I think point out like, well, you know, I mean I mean we're all we're all moral. So why why should we care that <laughs> if you at the end of the day like lose your 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 capacity to be immortal or whatever, right? But that, but again, yeah, that that is uh you know uh, one of the as as Drought points out, like one of the questions that fantasy keeps going back to because it's a question that that we we care about, like all of us, right? Like we may we may not all care about aging studies, but we we kind of care about dying. That's something we you know uh, something that. <laughs> that all of us sort of sort of care about right dying or being incapacitated or or disabled or sick you know and and so yeah fan and another thing so another thing i was going to say fantasy does right as you said like fantasy is seen uh as, as a simplistic genre right it's very you know it's good against evil and it's sort of always reduced to that right what i 
what I kind of tried to do in my in my own essay, right? Which is again very short, and I and I didn't manage to take uh, take a lot from from that um, series that um, I I decided to to pick up. But one thing I I think I tried to do is to show that um, the fact that these that the, that this genre is simplistic, right? And and this this nostalgia for the past or for a simpler time, right? In which, in which there is like a, the, the comfort of knowing who is good and who is evil and who is your enemy and who's your ally, right? So those are all things that sort of speak to an anxiety that we have in the present of not knowing how to place our, or where to place ourselves, right? Like, and who to ally ourselves with, right? And who our community is necessary right especially in a time as as uh, as divisive right as politically divisive as our own right that is i think a very loaded topic right that that fantasy does manage to not necessarily address but it gives you the comfort of uh or or the or it empowers you i that's the way at least i i put it in my in my essay right like it it tries to empower you to act regardless of the fact that that it's maybe not possible to act in a super like morally clear way in in the contemporary world right so that you know that's that's um i think we shouldn't think of fantasy as just being you know oh yeah you know it's for kids and simplistic and whatnot so i don't know um yeah i don't know i i i have a couple and and again like i i i don't want to take like a lot of your time so I, i'll just maybe i'll shut up and and uh one thing i will ask everyone is how you see this area of research developing in the future right so this is of course as i said like this collection is out uh, sarah and maricel have done their collection right so this we, we've done we've done it Right. So what now? What next? Right. So what 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 haven't we done, uh, uh, you know, in in regard to this, I guess, um, combination of, of topics that we um, addressed in, in these two books? Uh, what remains to be done? And, and, and here, let me also say, right, that this this book also sort of came out of a project that I was working on with Sarah and Maricel that ended up not getting funded, right? So this is the, at the end of the day, right? Like the, the effort that the three of us also put into that project, right? Which was going to be, you know, maybe, a, a, you know, a broader, more, you know, uh, in-depth, uh, looked at these at these two genres, right, of science fiction, fa fantasy, and speculative fiction, right, didn't end up happening. Uh, that's what we had in mind. Uh, I don't know. I wonder is 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 that still worth doing, is, or what what remains to be done? Is I guess my question um, to all of you. <laughs> I don't know myself. So 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 I'll just uh, I'll, I'll just leave it to you for you guys to decide. Well, if I may jump in, uh, let me just thank you, Joao, for your work, for the beautiful conference you organized. And I'm really glad uh, and proud to be part of this international research group that has been created by your acti activism. Um, I enjoyed very much reading the text because of the variety of, of approaches and textualities and genres. Um, and I think there is still space maybe for, let's say, a kind of second volume, a kind of follow-up, a sequel, um, looking at TV series, TV comedies, uh, films, uh, where eccentricities and experiments are about aging in particular are, are relevant. And I'm thinking of a couple of Italian examples. Um, there's a TV series called Barlume, which is a pan 
on the, the word bar, which is a kind of pub and uh, light. This is the name of the bar. And where there, there's a quartet of elderly men who play cards, who spend time gossiping and creating lots of troubles around the village. Um, so there are lots of examples of these types where aging and characters who are elderly people uh, behave in eccentric ways and uh, they are experimental both in terms of even the language they use. Uh, so from the linguistic point of view, uh, for the dialects they use and for the, again, experimentation uh, with genre, uh, narrative techniques and so on. So I think there is still space for inquiries into uh, TV series, film studies, narratives, and lots of things. Ah, thanks, Carmen. Uh, I, I, do, I do believe that, that you, you, I mean, for sure, like television is, is a, a very big thing and uh, at the moment and maybe this this collection in particular doesn't doesn't do it like uh other than the essay that that I was going to say that Maricel and Sarah wrote right uh but I believe their book uh may have more contributions along those lines and I know that Maricel in particular has done a lot of work on television in the past right so uh but for sure like uh that that's an avenue that we will have to keep uh um, pursuing. Uh, if I may ju jump in, yeah. Uh, also, I also want to thank Joao uh, to for your amazing work. And even though I wasn't initially part of the project, but I'm really happy to be part of it, and I'm really honored to be um, like having this collection with uh, lots of great scholars. I was really surprised how well like each essay is like, correspond to uh, each other and how it's a conversational, even though I actually didn't know what was out there. I was surprised to see how like uh, Michael's like uh, essay was very closely related to mine and also uh, Maricel's and Sarah's essay uh, is a, uh, it's really connected to my on doctoral research. My current essay on Atuli was part of my doctoral uh, dissertation. And it's about how uh, we think about temporality from aging perspectives and like disability studies perspective. So I was really happy to see this like uh, conversational uh, relationship between it. And I think this collection is really valuable in terms of how uh, how we think about the future of aging, because that's is really, we already talked about it, but like it's really limited um, discourse about how like future and aging is, hasn't been really correlated in, in many discourses. So I think just like thinking about future of aging itself, it's very valuable. And as you said, like, um, at the end of my doctoral dissertation too, I was thinking, what is dementia, future futurity of dementia, or like thinking about from crib futurity, like so aging futurity or dementia futurity. So that that kind of question was, uh, what uh, what is like remaining to me, and I think this kind of gave me the idea about. Oh, like I was constantly looking at the representative works of what, how we are representing or mirroring the current situation, but actually the fantasy and the, the more experimental works can open up the new possibilities and new uh, perspectives that can actually counter uh, normative expectations and all the possibilities. So uh, it was a, a good learning for, for myself. And about your last question, uh, it that is a, a very interesting question I just thought about. And I feel like there will be also difference between how culturally uh, we imagine aging differently. The future of imagine can, uh, future of aging can be imagined differently depending on uh, our cultural differences or racial differences. And also do we 
imagine aging in the same way based on our own age, like the young people, how young people imagine the aging future versus how current older generation imagine future. Like I think that will be something I'm interested to finding out. So anyway, yeah, thank you everyone for your great work and yeah, I'm looking forward to having further conversation. Thank you, uh, Han Jung. I, 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 I will say two things. Let me just draw attention to what Michael said in, in the chat. Uh, Michael was, was bringing up uh, his most recent uh, book, uh, Distressing, Distressing Language, which I, I've already uh, been uh, using in my class. Uh, uh, I don't, uh, and uh, <coughs> the, wait, wait, give me, give me, a, Michael, what? Because you, you you published two books back to back. Was distressing language, and and what was the other one? Well, there's a the book before that is called. Um, Invalid or Invalid Modernism, and it's a reading of modernist texts, um, many canonical texts and some not so canonical uh, in terms of their representation of disability. But my focus, as my essay indicates, is also on the aesthetic implications of uh, disability, and in particular, the the absence of disability in aesthetic discourse, even though uh, the, the classical aesthetics is full of representations of uh, disabled figures like Oedipus uh, or King Lear or whomever. <clears throat> I wanted to say something, though, about, uh, about Han Jung's remarks about temporality. One of the things I think that will have to happen in the future is that the current discourse around alternate temporalities and futurity is being written around youth. It's all being written around how queers or crips can imagine a different future for themselves, presuming, of course, that these are uh, youthful imaginations of futurity. Uh, Esteban Munoz's great book on utopia is all about this. What your book and what all of our discussion uh, implies is that we really must understand what a futurity means for a person of extreme old age. Are there no futurities for aging people? And what does the concept of, of futurity mean if you don't take into account the life course and the very varying uh, protocols for thinking about what the next step is? If the only thing that uh, is conjured by the term the next step is cure, or prognosis, or you know, the next biopsy and the next doctor's appointment, then of course we're not thinking about futurity in ontological existential terms. And so I think one of the things your book is doing is asking us to revisit some of these key tropes in cultural studies and queer theory and in crip theory uh, in terms of the aging body and aging capabilities. No, and for sure, there's a lot. Uh, I, I'm um, like, unfortunately, I, I would say like, there's not a lot of, uh, not maybe maybe with the exception of your your own essay, Michael, and and maybe Han Jung's essay. There's not a lot of. Um, that we did, I guess, in this book about extreme old age, right? As you said, right, and 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 dementia, right? But uh, I, I mean, as my, you know, fellow aging studies uh, scholars here know, there's there's a lot of very interesting research that's been done about that, right? Like about like there being a, a future, I guess, for someone that is that is extremely ill or. Uh, in, or with dementia and whatnot, uh, um, and and a pre I mean a future and a, and a present, right? Because one thing that I that I also made very clear uh, in my both in my introduction and in the project that I'm still working on now, which focuses on uh, you know aging in 
uh, contemporary experimental writing, right? Is that most of the most of the work that aging artists are doing is about the present, right? Which is something that we sort of uh, have a hard time wrapping our hands around. But uh, it's not about the past, right? Like older people do not necessarily, you know get stuck in the past or are constantly writing about the past or rem reminiscing or, or you know, just uh, uh, um, looking back or, or doing retrospective work, right? And a lot of these, you know, and, and that's that's for sure uh, one of the things that I wanted to to emphasize with this collection. I, I for example, I remember that uh, my initial, um, when I first approached Ryan uh, to write an essay for the the collection, right? Like I was like, well, man, I wish I had something in the book about, uh, uh, you know, Scott Walker's, um, um, you know, late work, right? Because I don't know if you're familiar with this this artist that you know he, throughout his career, uh, in, when he was most popular, I guess he wrote uh, more or less like uh, Serge Gainsbourg style. Uh, I, Ryan, please. Uh, uh, correct me if I'm if I'm saying you know something stupid, but you know he was writing like chamber pop, like you know songs with very elaborate lyrics, and then in his old age, uh, in his what late seventies or eighties, he just completely switched to this noise drone. Uh, uh, you know, I'm sure you can do a better better job here, Ryan. But uh, but yeah, no, I wanted you know I wanted the book to have. Um, you know, contributions or essays about, you know, cutting edge work that's being done by older people, right? Because there's this idea that, you know, just because you're old, you, 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 you're, you're out of the, you, you, you know, you're no longer an innovator, right? You're not, and this is something, of course, that you do in your essay, Michael, right? Is to show that how wrong that idea uh, is, right? Um, yeah, I don't know. I wanted. I just wanted to to Mariana. I wanted to bug you because you haven't said anything yet. So I want to uh, ask you if you if you have like. Uh, I know that you, Mariana, by the way, is is uh, working on a uh, a chapter for my other collection that that is even more. Let, let me just say this: uh, the. If this this collection is diverse, right, both in terms of like you know bringing in people that are not from aging studies and maybe people that are not necessarily like you know again like tenure track professors and whatnot, I think the the fear of aging uh, collection that's coming out uh, later this year or next year, I we we still don't know, right? But it's um, it's it's almost finished. Uh, Mariana is also writing an essay for that. Uh, here you focused on Mary Poppins uh, and th the figure of the child, right? Which we we haven't really talked much about, right? Michael, again, um, you you said, and that's uh, that's a very important thing, right? Is that the notions of futurity that we have, right? Uh, and here I'm thinking, of course, about Lee, Lee Edelman's. Uh, you know, no future, and then you know what Cynthia Port in Aging Studies does with uh, queer theory and whatnot, right? But the figure of the child, right, is normally you know what grounds our perspective of the future. Uh, so, Mariana, do you do you uh, have something to say about what you did with uh, the child, and and you know this being a text that the uh, I'm sorry, a film. That is for children, and what do children have to, I guess, contribute to aging, and and how do they contribute to aging? And, uh, Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Hi. You know, it's it was a pleasure working with you. Uh, when I started writing this chapter, I, I didn't expect me to focus on like the figure of the child, but. To be honest, since I was like little, this this was something that was in the back of my mind because the adults in my life, they kept telling me that I had to respect them because they were old. And I questioned that in my head, like when I was five, 
it was like but respect is like for all people it's not it doesn't depend on age so because I was kind of naughty I had that in my in my head the whole time and I was happy to somehow articulate that in the um, in the chapter about Mary Poppins because it seems to be there seems to be an inversion of like expectations of what an adult is supposed to be like a child a child is supposed to be like and um yeah Mary Poppins comes to organize that so it wasn't something that I originally anticipated but I think there is a book by what's her name um Gillette I forgot her name do you know what I'm who I mean yeah okay where she's uh she means that like age studies it shouldn't be only about older people it should be about all ages so I was kind of tapping into that and adding that to the work because I thought it was important and also in my dissertation I'm finding that um intergenerational re relationships are really important so I was interested in that I don't know if I answered your question no, I mean, uh, yeah, I, th I think for, I mean, Mary Poppins is like the the paradigmatic, I guess, uh, text uh, or film, I guess, that inverts, as you said, that that whole idea of like, oh, yeah, we, we should all be adults, right? And being an adult is the, you know, is the way to go. Uh, and and that's, you know, the, the, you know, the movie just shows, shows how, uh, I guess the the value of of being, and that that's something that I'm very much uh, interested in, and in, in my my own work in aging studies, and 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 again, like the project that I'm working on, uh, that I mentioned before, right? Is is how uh, precisely like childishness and playfulness and humor and whatnot can um, what what those things can bring to the table uh, when you're an adult. Right, uh, because as you said, right, there's no right way of uh, growing old, right, and, and uh, we for sure should not, like at least not in my opinion, shouldn't be, you know, celebrating the, the you know, the, uh, you know, the, oh, how how great it is to, you know, do your taxes and, uh, you know, uh, take your kids to school or whatever, you know, but, I mean, just just the joy of uh, of being silly and and. And saying stupid things and experimenting and you know making mistakes and that's all something that that I believe um, should be part of this this discussion and should be part of uh, just the way of we uh, the way we relate to other people and how we relate to other people regardless of their age right so yeah. Uh, so, guys, that's it for me. I, I, I think we can call it a day, right? The, we've, I've, I've held you here for an hour. So uh, unless you have something else to say, thank you all for coming. And uh, this will, uh, again, like this video will stay on Facebook. So if you want to uh, share it with your, with your loved ones, uh, that's something uh, that uh, I would very much appreciate because you're, of course, advertising the book as well. So um you know yeah i'll i'll see you see you again soon and uh michael have a nice day and uh hanjung uh have a good night uh see you all thank very you. soon thank you for coming bye bye thank, thank you. you thanks everybody bye. thank you everyone bye bye, -bye. bye.